it's a it's a blessing to be in the house. Amen. 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 It's Amen. A blessing. Can I get a, uh, a sound check there, fellas? They're working on it. Nothing else will hand you the microphone. Right. Exactly. All right. Well, I know we're ready to study, so let's get right in. Dive in. Amen. Amen. Well, right. Good morning, folks. Can you hear me? All right. Very good. Very good. Well, nothing like a little bit of rain to uh, let us know it is fall. And, uh, well, God blessings to you. We are, uh, we're enjoying our day of rest, are we not? Amen. It's wonderful to see all of you here today. And uh, I had some phone calls today. I was busy on the phone this morning. And people were calling saying, I want to come to your church. How do I get there? So I was giving directions on the phone this morning, which is a great problem to have when you're a pastor. So uh, praise the Lord. But uh, we have a lot to be excited for today, a lot to be thankful for. And uh, let's bow our heads as we begin the Word of God. Thank you for being our Lord and Savior, Jesus. This morning is the day that you appointed as holy, the day you appointed as sanctified. And we lift up the name of Jesus at this time, Lord. We come together with you on your appointed day to talk about the truth that you have given us, a truth that may seem very, very far from what we've always believed or possibly brand new in many other senses. But, Lord, it is the truth, and it is the truth that we came here to hear. It's the truth we want to live and follow in our heart. So, Lord, bless us with your truth today. Show us the rest of the story as we have prepared for, and we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today we have the Revelation's Lake of Fire. As David said, it is a hot topic, and uh, we are going to talk in depth about what the Bible says, not just the book of Revelation, but what the book of Revelation says is repeated throughout many books in the Bible. Just for a quick view of the next few days, this is about all the future I can tell is what's coming up. Monday at 7, 15, 15, 666, and the mark of the beast. I suspect no one will miss that one. They hardly ever do. The place is usually full that day for good reason. Tuesday evening, my other best friend has promised to join us here. Please pray for Nick. He, uh, I spent some time with him yesterday, and uh, he is... Uh, planning on being here for USA in Bible Prophecy. To Thursday evening, Revelation Saints. We'll be talking about who the saints are, as described in the book of Revelation. But this morning, Revelation's Lake of Fire. Not a lot of topic, a lot of scripture on the actual word lake of fire, that little phrase, but uh, there's lots of talk, talk about what it's actually referring to. So what does the Bible really say about hell? What does it refer to? Is it, is it a place? Is it an event? Is it burning now? People wonder these questions. A lot of theology out there saying hell exists today. But does the Bible actually tell us that's what's happening? Now, the creator of the universe in his justice says that sin must be destroyed. Hell is actually the process by which re- this final removal of sin will take place. Now, God is long-suffering. He is willing to do anything that none should perish, but all should come to repentance and have everlasting life. He's telling us the sad truth is not all will heed that counsel. You are here today because you want to know what the counsel is because you want the opportunity to make the choice for yourself. Amen? Amen. So will there come a day where there will be a, a destroying fire, and we're going to talk today about what that is. Little review, events at Christ's coming, just to set the stage for where we're at in the prophetic timeline. Believers are resurrected when Christ returns. That should be pretty clear to you by now. Believers receive immortality at that point. The wicked living are consumed. Their souls are consumed by the brightness of Christ's coming. And the wicked dead remain in their graves. And it says in Revelation 20... The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. We spent the last Thursday evening on this topic in great detail. And that is when the wicked dead would actually be resurrected again. So remember what Jesus said in John chapter 5. 
says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming which all who are in the graves will rehear his voice. It's no surprise that if only the righteous are resurrected at the first resurrection, the rest of the all will be resurrected later. And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So we have seen this many times throughout the presentation, but uh, this is what's going to be recorded in the books, and John talks about when these things will take place. Now, I put together this graph for you, and if you want a copy of it, we'd be happy to print these off uh, just to show you kind of a high-level vision of the things we've been studying, little points on a timeline just to keep us in our head where things are at from point to point. So we have this situation here where we're now in this process where God's people are being sealed. And the mark of the beast is coming right around the same time in the chronology of of time. Then there will be seven last plagues. We haven't spoken of them yet in detail. And then Jesus returns to the earth. Satan is bound. And this is also what we call the first resurrection, where the saints go to heaven. Now, the wicked are slain at this point, and we begin the thousand-year period, this blue line here, that takes us all the way over to the point where Satan is once again loosed out of his prison. Wicked reorganize, the second resurrection resurrection happens, and the wicked reorganize, and the new Jerusalem descends to the earth, and the wicked try and take the city. So I like to see things at the 30,000-foot level. So this This picture helps me. If you want a copy of it, we will definitely get you one. Uh, But the focus of Revelation, the focus of all these topics is this part right here. Jesus returning to the earth. That's the central theme of everything that's going on. All these other things are just peripheral to that event. So we see this chart, and we know that uh, New Jerusalem will, in fact, descend to the earth. And how do we know that? We know that by Revelation 21.2. Prophet John says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So New Jerusalem represents God's people, God's church. Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is his bride, and that bride, that city of gold, will descend down to earth. Revelation 20, verse 9, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and encompassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. We're talking about the wicked now. And fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. This devouring, this all-consuming fire that is spoken of right here is the last phase in the judgment. It is the execution of the sentence that was given during the judgment. So this time... We see that there would be something here referred to as hell fire. Not referred to it here, but we're talking about fire coming down from heaven that will devour these that were raised in the second resurrection. Revelation 20.10 says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Then death and Hades, talking about the grave, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Is there any doubt about what the second death is? It's when the wicked, the devil, and all those who serve the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire to consume them, and there will be no more sin forever. That's what the topic of tonight is about. Sin being eradicated once and for all. But it refers to this process of throwing these things into the lake of fire as the second death. So, in order for there to be a second death, there has to be a second resurrection. We've already talked about that. I'd like to do a little bit of review of the previous topic here because it helps to hear it for a second time. So, where does this hell take place? Place? Well, it says they compassed the earth, right? New Jerusalem comes down to the earth. The wicked encompass the great city and the beloved people of that city. So this process of fire consuming them is taking place on earth. Now that might be a surprise to some people, but that's what the Bible actually tells us. So some of the questions of what hell is about is where is hell taking? Well, it is happening here on earth. We will we'll discuss that from many different scriptures today. When is hell taking place? Well, we know it's definitely after the second resurrection, after the millennium. The thousand-year period is finished. 
then this time of fire consuming the wicked will take place. Now, how long is hell? How long does it last? This might be one of the questions that's most burning in people's mind. How long is hell? Maybe if it's not burning today, is there a start and an end period to the time of destruction? Where, it, why is there a hell is, uh, is really the most important question. Why do we have to have a hell? The Lord gives us great detail and is telling us there will be a hell so that we don't have to take part in it. So where is hell? It's going to be here on earth. And if you go to Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 18, it says, You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. We're talking about Satan now. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the, what? Upon the earth. Notice how it doesn't say inside the earth. In the sight of all who saw you, there will be witnesses to this event. It's not going to be a secret event. People will notice. And notice what's happening in this final destruction where the devil will be returned to ashes and it will happen upon the earth. So, when is hell? Job 21.30 For the wicked are reserved for the day of doom. What does the word reserved mean? Set aside for a future time, right? They're reserved for the day of doom. Now how long is a day? Well, that's good. That's good. A, a day is a year in Bible prophecy, but how long is a literal day? 24 hours. Genesis says it's an evening and a morning. Now, even if we were to apply biblical prophetic time to a day, we're still only talking about a year. It's still a beginning and an ending point that's given here. But there will be a day of doom, and the wicked are reserved for that day somewhere in the future, according to Job. And Revelation tells us the rest of the future, but Job is alluding to what Revelation is talking about. They shall be brought out on the day of wrath. Now, Matthew 3, 13, 30 tells us a parable. In the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares. What are tares? Weeds, right? The weeds grow with the tares. The, the wheat grows with the tares. And uh, it will happen that way until the time of the end. And bind them into bundles to what? Burn them. Once again, Jesus is referring to the future, final consummation of the wicked using fire. But will gather the wheat into my barn. Now, what does the wheat represent? The saints. Very good. The wheat is the grain. The wheat's the purpose for the harvest. That's what we're going out to gather. But first, the tares must be bundled together and they will be burned. And God's people will be brought into, here it says the wheat into the barn. The saints will be brought into God's house, his sanctuary, his holy city, New Jerusalem. Matthew 13, 40 says, As therefore the tares are gathered in the, and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. So when is hell taking place? At the end of the world. Now, many people say, well, I was taught that when you die, you go to heaven or you go to hell. It's not what the Bible is saying. The Bible is talking about the end of the world. We see this over and over again. The Bible is very, very consistent. So we're talking about the end of the earth is when hell will take place. A revelation teaches that it devours the unrighteous at the end of the thousand years. Just to give us a time frame, Peter taught that the earth and the ungodly would be destroyed and reserved for hellfire. Job said the same thing. He used the word reserved, but talks about the day of doom. And then Jesus himself taught the unrighteous would be burned at the end of this world in his parable about the wheat and the tares. Is that enough prophets for you? to show the clarity of the Scripture on the subject of when it's going to take place. It should be. If not, I can show you more. 
Matthew 25, 31 to 41. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the nations will be gathered before him. Notice we're talking about gathering again. Then the kings will say to those on his right, I'm sorry, the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father. It's referring to Jesus. Jesus is talking about his father. Jesus is the one gathering. He's the one with the sharp sickle in his hand, according to the book of Revelation. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom. The meek, the poor, the humble inherit the kingdom. That's what we're called to be, to be God's people. But Jesus is saying at this time when he comes, inherit the kingdom. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting what? Fire. Now the word everlasting tends to throw people, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the word everlasting. So how long is hell? That's the question we're on right now in our study. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. Notice the consistency. We're talking about a day, and we're talking about a fire being burned. Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. God's people are humble, the wicked are proud. But they will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. Now the book of Malachi is the last book before we get into the New Testament, and it is one of the final warning messages we get from the Old Testament, referring to this. So what does the Bible mean when it uses the expression everlasting destruction or eternal fire? This is a very, very good question. We need to very carefully dissect what the Bible is saying. We even need to go back to the original terms used to really know what it is. But we can also go back to some of the biblical stories to analyze what it's saying here. What about Sodom and Gomorrah? There was a time when these cities were destroyed by Fire and brimstone, the exact same thing that God says will happen during the destruction of the wicked in the final consuming fire. But Lot was here with his wife, and there was terrible, terrible atrocities being committed in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and people were living against God in rebellion. Jude chapter 1 and verse 7 says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now we know there is even, if you go to the land that still exists today where Sodom and Gomorrah was, there is in the dirt, deep in the dirt, sulfur crystals that can only be created in the intense heat. And they don't really know how they got there. The Bible tells us how they got there because those cities were destroyed by fire. But let me ask you a question. When it says eternal fire, people think it means the fire is burning forever. That's where some of the concept of eternally burning hell permanent torture for the rest of eternity comes from. But let me ask you something. In that land that still exists today on the earth, where Sodom and Gomorrah once stood, is it still on fire? The Bible says eternal fire, but they're not burning today. The fire has gone out. What was eternal is the effects upon the people in the cities who were burned. God's judgment is what is eternal, okay? Stick with me. We're going to go into this a little bit deeper. Sodom and Gomorrah were burned with an eternal fire, but it's talking about the effects upon those who were judged, not on the fire itself. Malachi 4.3, You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. So the wicked will be ashes once again. The wicked will be turned into ashes, not burned continually for millions and trillions of years. When you light a fire, it will eventually turn to ash. 
And we're told that we go back to dust, correct? When we are judged and, and the wicked are burned, they will go back to dust as well, but they will not burn forever. It will just simply be dust. It will be ashes upon the earth. So, eventually the fire goes out and ashes remain. An eternal fire is one whose effects or results are eternal. An everlasting punishment is one punishment whose effects or results are eternal. So when we talk about these things, we speak about Matthew 24, 25, 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Eternal punishment does not mean eternal punishing. There's a big difference. Amen. I'm glad one person said amen. Because we should not want to see people suffer forever. That is not the Lord we serve. His Bible does not teach that he will suffer people forever. God's plan is to get rid of sin. His plan is to get rid of sin from you so you don't go down with the sin. Everlasting punishment is not everlasting punishing. What about the Bible expression, unquenchable fire? Okay, very good question. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. If your hand, by which we do our work, causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Okay, so we're talking about a fire that shall never be quenched. Sounds again like eternal fire. Let's look at what it's really saying. It goes on and says, Where their worm does not die and fire is not quenched. Okay, this is a quote. This is a quote from the book of Isaiah. So please open your Bibles to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, 24. Let's take a biblical view of what these terms mean. Because as with all symbolic and metaphoric language found in the book of Revelation, we have to go back to the Old Testament or even to the New Testament to see what it actually is referring to. So Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 24. Powerful chapter, Isaiah 66. If you felt compelled to read that, you would be amazed at all the... The detail it gives us. Isaiah 66, 24. Wonderful to hear pages turning. It's a beautiful wind when the pages are turning. Okay, it says, And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of men, who have transgressed against me. Talking about the Lord. For their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So this is referring, where this is quoted, it's referring to corpses. It doesn't say corpses that are on fire. It just says it's referring to the dead. So when we're talking about this fire that is not quenched, this worm that will not die. We are talking about the fact that these people will be dead and they will not have a chance to live again. Now, Jeremiah talks about this fire as well. 1727, Then I will kindle a fire in its gates and shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall not be quenched. Same concept. It shall not be quenched, this fire. Is Jerusalem on fire today? We know California is. We know Oregon was burning. Washington. Jerusalem's not on fire today. So the fire was put out. But it was not put out by human effort. When God kindles a fire, only God will put it out. Amen? No human effort is going to do the job. So the fire cannot be quenched. Um, this was predicted, the, the burning of Jerusalem in 2 Chronicles 36, by the way, 3619. If you want to go look that up, um, that will give you a little bit more detail about the, the burning of Jerusalem. Um, 
Uh, let's go to Ezekiel 2. Let's just go there. We have time. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verses 47 and 48. Okay, are you there, friends? Say amen if you're there. Amen. Okay, the Bible says, And say to the forest of the south, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. Behold, I will kindle a fire in you, and it shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. The blazing flame shall not be quenched. All the faces from the south and the north shall be scorched by it. All the flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. Human effort will not quench any fire that the Lord has kindled. I like 49, too, just as a little offside. It says, Then I said, Ah, the Lord God, say of me, does he not speak parables? How did Jesus teach us? In parables. That's right. Ezekiel was predicting one of Jesus' manners of teaching. All right, well, moving on. An unquenchable fire is one that no human hand can put out. We have enough trouble putting out regular fire, much less the fire that the Lord kindles on Judgment Day. Revelation 14.10 He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Now, we're talking about again them having no rest day or night. Whatever this time period is, it will not be fun for the wicked. They will be alive. They will be destroyed with fire. And they will not rest. There will be no rest from it until the fire is completely consumed them. It's the same as this fire in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the same as the fire in Jerusalem. The fire will go out. The effects of the fire will be permanent. Obadiah 15, 16. For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. Notice how we're talking specifically about the nations being brought down, just like Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8. Obadiah is again talking about the nations being brought down. And he's saying it is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. The wicked will be as though they had never been. They will be erased, and it will be permanent. There will be no chance at this point. I mean, we're as far down the timeline as we can get in the Bible. And God's saying, this is it. You see the prophetic language here about being tormented forever. It's metaphoric, friends. It's a metaphor for the permanency of God's judgment. It's irreversible. We cannot stop the fire until it is fully accomplished. We won't, fi- we won't stop it at all. The Lord will stop it, but not until it's completely done. And the smoke rises forever, right? We have fire, we're going to have smoke but it's going to go it's going to finish as soon as the fire finishes. Now the key to understanding Revelation's warning is this word forever. So let's look at just the typical understanding of what hell is. Popular teaching of hell hellfire says that the tormented are eternally tormented and burned by the devil forever. The logic of this teaching is the devil is literally in charge of hell. Now we know Christ says, I have the keys of death and Hades. The devil is not in charge of hell. But to believe this teaching of everlasting burning hell, we have to look at some of these basic principles that underlie it. 
The devil is not in charge of hell, but that's what has to be the case. Now Cain, let's just talk about Cain for a minute, the first human born of Adam and Eve. Cain committed murder, did he not? He killed his brother Abel. Now Cain is dead, correct? Cain is dead and buried in the ground. For killing one person, he's been suffering. If there's an eternal hell immediately when you die, he's been suffering eternally for 6,000 years for one murder. Now how long has Pol Pot been dead? 60, 70 years? How about Hitler? Stalin? People who have been involved in mass genocides, millions and millions of people were killed in Russia under Joseph Stalin. Would it make sense for them to burn eternally the same way as Cain burned for one murder? It doesn't stand to reason. Think of it even this way, where somebody made a really bad mistake when they were 18 years old. They were racing their car, and they, they, they smash it and die. And they were reckless, and they were irresponsible, and maybe even they killed other people. Should they burn forever for that one mistake? That's just not the Lord we serve. That's nothing to do with the character of Christ. That is the character of the devil who would punish people forever. But friends, that's exactly why hell shows the love of Christ. That's why hell shows the love of Jesus, because Jesus is not willing to let his people be under the thumb of the devil for eternity. He's going to remove them and put them out of their misery, out of their slavery and their bondage to the devil. So even in this destruction, we see the love of Christ. Even loving those who have turned away and completely rejected him, even spitting in his face or spitting on the cross or defying the name of Jesus. God still loves them enough to destroy them. But this false doctrine here of the devil being in charge of hell has led many people astray. That movie we gave away, The Hell and Mr. Fudge, it's an excellent documentary of what the Bible really teaches. This man lost everything trying to teach people what the Bible really says. But he has a remarkable story. And he did well to stand alone when nobody else was listening to what he was saying. He went through terrible hardships in his life. Anthropological dualism has done such serious harm in weakening our blessed hope of Christ appearing and distorting our understanding of the world to come. Worst of all, it has given rise to the sadistic teaching that God makes the wicked suffer unending conscious torment in hell. This is written by a man named Charles Pinnock, a professor of theology, uh, McMaster Divinity School in Canada. I don't know him. But uh, this is something he came, this is the conclusion he came to as well. And I think the way he mentioned this is consistent with what the Bible teaches. Now this, this idea of anthropological dualism, it just states that, that we are going to have this immortal soul within us, which we've already completely debunked the idea of the immortal soul. We have a mortal soul that dies. We put on immortality at the second coming. But this anthropological dualism is just a fancy word that says we have an immortal soul that can never die. And that is the underlying understanding. That's the false doctrine underlying the idea that hell is going to burn people forever. That's where it comes from, all the way back to Greek mythology. That's the origin of this stuff. Worst of all, it has given rise to the sadistic teaching that God makes the wicked suffer an ending consciousness torment in hell. Well, we have defined hell will have a beginning and an end point, not an eternal burning, which has been such a burden to the Christian conscience and an unnecessary offense to many seekers. This has turned many people away from God. For good reason. If this is what God really is, I wouldn't want to follow him either. But this is not our Lord. Our Lord is long-suffering, enduring much pain, so that every one of us can one day make the decision to follow Christ and live and not be part of this final hellfire. John Stott, rector emeritus All Souls Church, founder and president of the London Institute of Christianity, says, as a committed evangelical, 
My question must be and is. Not what does my heart tell me? What does Disney teach? Follow your heart. The question must not be what does my heart tell me, but what does God's word say? Amen. And in order to answer this question, we need to survey the biblical material afresh. Study it in the morning, friends. God has something for you every day in that book. Make the appointment and find out what he has. You will be blessed every single day about what he teaches you. But we must, I agree with him, we must have the biblical material afresh in our mind and open our minds and not just our hearts to the possibility that Scripture points to annihilation and that the doctrine of eternal consciousness torment is, has to yield to the superiority authority of Scripture. God is going to annihilate sin. He's not going to punish people eternally. 1 Samuel 1.22 I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. Now, when we're talking about the Lord, we're talking about forever. We will be with the Lord forever, no doubt. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So forever can mean a definite period of time. Now, how, why is hell? Why do we have to have a hell? And the answer is so simple. Why does it have to be hell? Because Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But we're not just talking about one death. We're talking about the first death and possibly the second death if you do not, if you reject Christ. Matthew 7.13 says, For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. When I lived in New York City, my apartment was at 51st and 7th. And those two streets intersection just about at where a street, a very famous street, intersects, and it's called Broadway. And I'll tell you, when I'm living there for six months, it's a pretty fitting name. Because it is the Broadway, it is the sinful path to destruction. But the Bible says wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction because this is the way of convenience, friends. This is the way of the world, not the way of standing up for Jesus. The rock band ACDC, a song called Highway to Hell. It's almost an American anthem. Celebrating, I'm on the highway to hell. Nobody even thinks about the lyrics. I had several of you people tell me, I've been listening to the Rolling Stones my whole life. I had no idea. Mick Jagger had the devil tattooed in his chest and that the lyrics were talking about Lucifer. But we sing these songs not really realizing highway to hell is not a good thing. But you watch an ACDC concert, they're all cheering. Highway. Deception. Being led astray into eternal Fire, friends, from which there will be no second chance. The Bible is saying if you're on the highway of hell, friends, there's still time to get off while you're among the living. Amen. Amen. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is God's goal. This is God's plan. This is why this building exists. Amen? Luke 3, 13, 3 also talks about the unrepentant perishing. So let's talk a little bit about what the wicked will be doing in this life rather than praising the name of Jesus. When God consumes sin, he consumes those who cling to sin. This is the, this is the very thing that we have to understand. If we're clinging to sin, if even if it's just one sin, we're going to go down with it. Because sin will be burned. It's like the hot potato. Get rid of it. Move it out of your life. Christ will do it for you if you give him the opportunity. Matthew 25, 41 says, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, and all who follow the devil and his angels, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Friends, a repentant heart is a free heart. It's a peaceful heart. 
It's a heart that is no longer worried and stressed out and needing antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication. It's a free heart. Repentance is a gift, friends. I'm not saying it might not be easy when you first time you try it, but repentance is a gift. It brings freedom to our life. So once again, our chart, we have this mark of the beast. We have the seven last plagues. We have Satan bound and the wicked are slain. But Satan will be loosed at the end of the thousand years. And then we will see hell fire. After he is redeceived the nations one more time, after they're resurrected the second time, in the second life, he will redeceive them into thinking they can take God's city away from him. Philippians 3.18 calls the people who have rejected God that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ and whose end is what? Destruction. It says whose end is destruction. If there's an eternal burning hell, how can this scripture be right? It says there's an end to the wicked's destruction. The destruction will take place, but it will end and the wicked will be as if they never were. That's hard for us to sometimes understand, especially if there's someone we love that will be in that class. But friends, if you suffer it, know that Jesus Christ suffers it even more. Because all those who are lost, Jesus knew them all. We only knew the handful of people in our lives. Jesus is suffering for every single one of them. And we know this by the scripture. It says, And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. How many can tell me the auto ignition temperature of hydrogen? The elements will burn, friends. Things that we've never seen burn before will burn. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. The Spontaneous ignition of the air of, of hydrogen is 932 degrees Fahrenheit. Almost 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not a meteorologist, but I will predict it'll be hot that day. <laughs> Friends, think about what will burn. Everything will burn. The elements will burn with a fervent heat. This earth... The beautiful earth that we have has to go because sin is a part of this world. But God says, I will build you another one. Amen? Can he do it? Yeah. Amen. He can do it. So the Bible calls this earth the lake of fire. Is that clear? The lake of fire will be here upon the earth, it says. It's not a place burning today. Hell is a final destruction of the wicked that purifies the earth at the end of time when they are totally consumed. The war between good and evil ends now. So the fate of the wicked. The wicked will die. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. The wicked will perish. Luke 13.3. The wicked will be burnt up. Malachi 4.1. Burnt up meaning totally burnt. The wicked will be utterly consumed. What does it mean to consume? When you're done eating your apple, you've consumed it. There's no more apple. It's gone. As if it wasn't there. The wicked will be turned into ashes, back to the dust from which they came. The wicked will be as though they had not been. Obadiah 16. They will be consumed. Satan will be totally destroyed, Isaiah 47, 14. Would you like those printed off too, friends? Okay, we'll, we'll have uh, our uh, seminar coordinator print those off for you. We have a wonderful printer, and we love to use it, so we'll, we'll get some of those to you. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 21. For the Lord shall rise and bring to pass his strange act. Why would it, why would it describe hellfire as a strange act? 
It's out of character for the Lord, friends, because the Lord is loving and long-suffering. He wants people to be in his family, but he's also a Lord of justice. But it's strange for the Lord to destroy his people. But it is by their own choice. It's because they did not heed that final warning message. I'm talking about people today, but even in a time when the revelation wasn't able to be understood like it is today, they were given a message. They were given a chance. And we don't understand all the details, but God knows. He gave everyone a chance, and they have rejected him. So it's a strange act, but it's necessary because sin has to be done away with so that there will be peace. And the Bible says it will never rise up a second time. Ezekiel 18, 23, the Lord is weeping, friends. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Says the Lord. And not that he should turn from his ways and live? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Friends, give up sin for no other reason than for the heart of Jesus. Because he is suffering the loss of his people. And he will bless you. He will bring with you, a re- he will bring with him a reward. If you, if you pull one people from that fire, one person, we have a work to do. We have the power of the gospel we can take with us. It doesn't have to be our words. I haven't shared with you my words. The power is in the gospel. You can carry this sword too. And the Lord's asking you to carry that sword. At this point, I want to have Jana come up. and She's going to sing a song for us. We're talking about the end of sin, friends, and I want you to listen to the lyrics of this song. Think of the promise of his coming. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to Thee, whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am thy love, I own that has broken every barrier known now to be thine and thine alone, no lamb of God I come, I come. Thank you, Jana. The Lord is coming, friends. He will be here very soon. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 says, Nevertheless, we... Can I say we, friends? Are you with me on this? We, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It may be sad to think of this earth going away, But righteousness should be far more important to our heart. And he's going to give us a new earth, better than the one we have. 
Revelation 21.4 says, After this time, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow. This is after the thousand years it's referring to in 21. We're at the back end of the Bible here. There will be tears during the thousand years because people are going to be wondering why someone didn't make it to heaven. The record books will show. But at this time, God will wipe away all their tears. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. Neither shall be any more pain for the former things are passed away. This statement, again, cannot be true if there's eternal burning because people will be eternally crying. If God's going to wipe away all the tears, it's because things are passed away. Is that clear, friends? Our Lord is coming so soon. He's offering us this promise. We have the opportunity today to accept it or reject it, to set it aside or to live by it. God wants us to be an example for him. The light of Christ is brought to you in your life. It's being brought to you now. Tell somebody. Tell someone about it. Make that decision today. If you have your decision cards, please fill them out. Put the topic on the top with your name. Once again, these are invaluable. I go home and I stay up reading every single one of them. I can't wait to get home and see what your comments are, friends. Thank you so much for filling them out. The decision today is I choose to commit my life to following Christ now so that I will be among the faithful when the fires of hell forever destroy the sin and unrepentant sinners. That should be an easy one. Nobody wants to be part of that day. Can you make that decision, friends? Please stand with me and pray if you want to make that decision. Amen. Gracious, loving Father, thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for holding back the winds of strife that we will have a chance to make our decision for you. We know that you are holding out for every last person, but Lord, let none in this room be lost. Let us all take this promise and live by it and help others live by it that we will not be cursed when you return, but he will take us under his arms and take us home. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, we will have some discussion time as well. Uh, questions are on the board, and uh, I believe there will be some questions today. <laughs>